Hi, I'm Todd Nock. Welcome to my YouTube channel and to part two of this three-part illustration of uh, Jubilee from the X-Men. Uh, we're up to the inking stage now. Hopefully you had a chance to see part one, the pencil stage, and uh, let's just get right to the inks and uh, see what happens. So as you can see here, my pencils are pretty rough. I didn't go super tight because uh, I like to keep some energy in the pencils and let the life uh, come in the inking stage. So my main focus is to have the right, right shapes and placement and really let the, the, the line weights come with the inking stage. I've gotten to a point in my inks now where I feel fairly confident that I know what I want to do, that I don't have to pencil in the line weights uh, because th then I'm, I'm kind of doing the same job twice when I go to the inks. But uh, it took a while to get there, so I would pencil the line weights in, then ink the line weights, but after years of practice of that, uh, I don't have to really pencil in the line weights so much because I know what I'm going to, the, the, the line shapes that I want when I hit them with the inks. So I'm using the 01 here on the finer points of the face. I want to keep a very fine tipped uh, pen in use here to keep those lines crisp and clean, especially on the face. You want those details to, to be crisp and you don't want them to muddy. I'm not going to use a thicker pen. Uh, nib at this at this point because uh, it would it would muddy the image very quickly. Uh, th that's better for things like the jacket and the, the 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 body, the legs, the arms. But when it comes to the face, I like a a, a much smaller uh, nibbed pen. Usually the zero one, sometimes the double zero five if it's a smaller shot of the face. So as you can see here, now I am switching to the zero eight, the Pigma Micron zero eight. Uh, with this uh, thicker nibbed pen, I can hit the, the, the longer lines like here on the collar and even some of the shorter lines like the inside of the collar, the details there, and get the line weights that I want. Uh, I can apply just enough pressure to get thick and thin lines with a thicker nibbed uh, pen, but still too thick to use on the face, but it's great here for the different parts of her body and her costume. So I'm just going to add a little more detail here, um, and, and at this point I want to st stick with the uh, upper portion of, of Jubilee. So now I'm using my uh, Pentel Pocket Brush Pen. First I want to adjust, I guess, a little bit here of her, her shades, uh, her big pink shades. And now I'm going to cut in with the, the Pentel Pocket brush, brush Pen. She has dark hair, so utilizing this brush pen I can get these wisps of hair that flow and, and give a sense of uh, the shape and uh, but in, in fewer in fewer lines, fewer strokes, I'm gonna um, get the life to the hair. It's, 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 it was very challenging to learn how to use a brush pen. It's not easy. It takes a lot of practice. Uh, using the the Copic sketch markers, the brush tip of those Copic sketch markers were kind of like my my gateway to using a brush pen. That that, that brush nib was uh, on the Copic sketch markers really helped a lot. So if you don't feel good using a like a Pentel pocket brush pen right just yet, try experimenting with the brush tip of a Copic sketch marker. Uh, get get used to that feel because it's it's halfway between like a brush and a marker nib. Once you feel like you start to master that, then you can move into the brush pens like a Pentel pocket brush pen or maybe like a Zebra brush pen or the Pigment Micron brush pens and you'll find that the, the skills you've developed with using, using a Copic marker uh, brush tip from the sketch pens uh, translates. There's still a degree of difficulty that will have to be mastered because now you're going to full on brush with a Pentel pocket brush pen. Uh, but you're, you're, you're gonna find that, that some of those things that you've learned while using a Copic sketch marker brush tip are gonna translate just enough. It's kind of like taking the training wheels off of the bike. So a question I get fairly frequently from people, usually at conventions, is why I hold my pen the way I do. Uh, either resting it on the middle finger or then resting it on the ring finger, how I switch back and forth, and why I do that, how I learn that. That is actually a bad habit. Resting it on the ring finger, I, as a child in first grade, learning how to write, I had a difficulty holding the pencil correctly, so I held it incorrectly, but it got the job done. I'd always get in trouble for resting the pencil on my ring finger rather than the middle finger. It did Over time, I did learn to rest it on the, on the ring finger, but uh, I still couldn't break the habit of resting it on my middle finger. So I have found that utilizing uh, both uh, ways of holding the pen, pen or pencil uh, allows me to... Uh, achieve the, the certain angle I want in, in creating my art. So it's something that I is actually 
uh, a good habit and a bad habit that I utilize there. And there is no, no professional reason why that is. It's just something that I, I grew up doing all my life. So there's no, no hidden trick to why I hold my pens that way. And so you just saw me uh, ink uh, some of the, the plasma fireworks that Jubilee shoots off in red and blue ink. And I did this for a reason. I, I, I wanted to maintain uh, a, a, a lighter sort of look. So when I go to the watercolors in the next video, uh, the, 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 the fireworks have a different effect than, than uh, the rest of her, than, rather than who, her, her body, her hair, her face, her hands. Those, those are like solid objects. Uh, but the plasma is more like light and explosives. So using uh, the blue and the red, it's kind of like doing a color hold in, in when one does uh, digital coloring for comics. How you'll read, a, if you read a comic, sometimes you'll see Spider-Man's webs or the line art is in white or in like like light blue. That's usually done uh, taking the, the, the black and white light line work in the in Photoshop and converting it to a different color to give it a different effect. Same thing with like maybe Cyclops's optic blast, how the, the lines are now in red, uh, like a dark shade of red while the, the blast itself is regular red. Uh, th that's you oftentimes done digitally over the line art to create these different effects and create different levels and of, of um, the visual. So that's kind of the, the effect I'm, I'm looking to go for here, was uh, keeping her plasma uh, uh, powers a, a different on a different plane and, and visual effects. So and it'll come more together more when, when we uh, drop in the watercolors in the next video. So let me address line weights here real quick, because I have a lot of people ask about that. How to use them, when to use them, what they're there for. So kind of a basic rule of thumb, young inkers, is first off, consider your light source. Uh, oftentimes, uh, not every time, but oftentimes, uh, the lines get thinner if it's closer to the light source, because it's showing the light is kind of hitting in that place. And then there's a heavier line on the opposite side of, of that thing you're inking. So it's, you, you use a thicker, heavier line to create a sense of shadow. Now, it's, sometimes it can be very subtle, your thicks and thins. Sometimes they can be very very noticeable, you know, you very extreme from very thick to very thin, uh, just depending on the effect that you're going for. Another aspect of line weights is that it can give your character life and bounce and spark. It gives the viewer's eye something to play with. It's kind of like eye candy in a sense. So uh, sometimes eye candy is just a bunch of details, cross hatching, that, that can be eye candy. But I find for my style, for the way I work, line weights are a big aspect of that of that eye candy and that detail. It's, it's, it can be subtle, subtle detail, but it's there. And, and, and uh, it's my, my hopes to engage the reader, uh, engage the viewer with the character and how they're um, existing or moving or being on the page. Now, how I learned to, about line weights or how to do line weights was I studied Inker's work, uh, whether it be Scott Williams over Jim Lee, uh, Dan Green over Mark Silvestri, uh, T T Terry Austin over Arthur Adams or Rick Leonardi, some of my favorite artists and uh, paired with the favorite inkers. And I would look at where are those line weights? How do they, uh, what kind of shapes are they making? Where is this shape on the hand, on the chin, on the face, on the nose, on the collar, on the cuff, of the glove, of the boot, of the sole? So, you know, I, I would look at every little thing. The car, the tree, the, you know, the grass, the, the computer monitor, the keyboard, all these little things, the phone cord, back when telephones had cords. I would look at that and I would study that. And um, then I, when I'd go into my illustration, I'd give it a try. Try to find those line weights and try putting them in. And, and you know, it started off wonky at first, but then you, the more I did it, the more I would grow in that confidence, which really helps in getting your inks um, moving at a, at, a, at a timely pace, is developing that, that, that confidence. So those are some of, my, some of my basic thoughts on utilizing line weights. The science of it as well as kind of my personal preference is you want to consider light source and also the life of the character, the bounce, the movement of the character. How do you engage the reader? So keep these things in mind as you practice and you start to build up that confidence. So uh, another thing to keep in mind is that um, there are, can be a lot of details that we have to ink. And sometimes it can be a little overwhelming, and that's okay. It's okay to feel overwhelmed. My encouragement to you is to push through. I have a lot of young artists who say they have a hard time completing an illustration. And that's understandable, and I, you know, I don't fault anyone for that. I, but my encouragement is 
develop that endurance, develop that fortitude to, to see your illustration all the way through to the end, um, and to find the fun in it. Have fun. Sometimes what we're drawing isn't always fun. It can be a challenging, and that challenge can be frustrating, and we want to give up, and it, and we have to push through. I've had to push through so many of those obstacles in my path through my young art days, uh, and then something you know, can still happen to me nowadays here as, as a professional. But when I seek to find the fun in whatever it is I'm doing, I'm able to get through that part of whatever the challenge is, overcome that challenge, and then I've come away with learning something new. Now I have a new tool in my arsenal. So keep at it. And find the fun in drawing every little seam, every little little fold, um, and, and bring the life to those lines because your fans, your viewers are going to appreciate it. It's your gift to them. So, so, so put all those, put that attention in there. It doesn't mean you have to be overly detailed. You might have a very simplistic style. That's okay too. You just, it, it's just all those things, those aspects of the character's costume or the character's, uh, look are, are, are important parts there that brings the whole piece together in one cohesive, uh, image. All right, so here we are at the erasing stage, getting rid of all those extra pencil lines, and now this piece is ready for watercolor, which will be in uh, the third video of this series. So thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed yourself. Be sure to click like if you like this video, and uh, don't forget to subscribe to my channel for future videos. I'll see y'all real soon.